All right, today I'm going to start by reading a psalm and then I'll speak to you about my message. Psalms 96, 4 to 9. It says this, For the Lord is great and greatly to be praised. He is to be feared above all gods. For all the gods of the people are just idols. But the Lord made the heavens. In our honour and majesty are set before Him. Strength and beauty are in His sanctuary. Give to the Lord, O families of the peoples. Give to the Lord glory. Give Him strength. Give to the Lord the glory due to His name. Bring an offering. Come into His courts. O worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. Tremble before Him all the earth. Tremble before Him all the earth. When I read that Scripture, I, 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 again, it expounds the bigness of the God we serve. Have you ever gone out at night and looked into the heavens and seen the, the amount of stars you can just see? You know, there are millions and millions of stars. As far as anybody can tell, it doesn't end. And, and I look at this, and when I look into that and I think about this little speck called earth and then this little speck called me, uh, I, I get literally like feeling of, oh my gosh, who, are, who, who am I anyway? Who am I anyway? But the Bible says that God knows the hairs on our head. And so the God that created a universe that doesn't end. Have you ever considered that it's everlasting or eternal? Think about matter itself. It seems to be eternal that way. And it doesn't matter what you get, if you split it in a half, there's always another half to split. It doesn't matter how small you make it, there's something there. Maybe it's eternal that way as well. That's the bigness of our God. He's a big God. He's the creator of the universe. He said the God, the idols that men think of are nothing compared to the God that created the universe and the heavens. So today, my message to you and I is this. Let God be God. Let God be God in your life. Let God, that God, be God in your life. It's an interesting thought, letting God be God. Um, it's really the, 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 the challenge or the decision of whether I trust my own reasoning or I trust God's wisdom and God's Word and God's power. Do I trust what I know here of the world or do I trust in Him that created the world? And it's not easy. My, my relationship with God over the last 40 years, I guess, has been interesting and many times, sometimes I get really angry with God. I, I get upset with Him. I, I, I look at Him and say, God, You move so slowly. I want to get the world saved. Will You keep up? Well, well, let's do something special. Let's move quicker. It's almost like, God, You move so slowly. It's frustrating. Will You do? I'm begging You, do something. And yet there's other times where God does something immediately. Like, man, bang, 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 and I go, slow down, will you? I'm just made of the dust, for goodness sake. I, I, don't, I can't keep up with all of that. And then, then there's some times where I feel like my prayers are not being answered. Like, is there anybody home? Some of my biggest decisions in life are from God. God, show me the way. I almost looked to heavens and it was a sign in the Spirit that said, go on fishing. And then there's other times where I receive blessing and favour that I never prayed for. God's ways are different to our ways. And if we can let God be the God that He is and not the God we think that we want Him to be. The plain truth, is of, it, the plain truth of it is God's ways, God's thoughts are higher than your thoughts and your ways. God's ways are higher than my ways. Not, not a little bit higher, but a lot higher. Not just a little bit bigger, but a lot bigger. Not a little bit smarter, but a lot smarter. Isaiah 55, verses 8 and 9. For my thoughts, this is God speaking, for my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are your ways my ways, say the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts higher than your thoughts. He's just making it really clear to you and I that there is a better way than trusting who, how you think and that's to trust the way that God thinks, to trust in what He says and what He delivers. It's a whole nother level. It's almost like in life, we're sort of stuck in this traffic jam of life and, and we, can, we can see a little bit up the front, a little bit to the side, a, a little bit to the back, and as though God has this aerial view of our lives, He's up higher, He can see way down the track, He can say way to the side, way to the side, way to the back. So He knows where we're going, He knows what's up front, He understands it all. His ways are higher than our ways. 
and we'll never be able to see it like God. This is the part we've got to get used to. You and I will never see the world, life, the things you go through the way God, see, not till we get to heaven, will we understand some of the journeys we went through, some of the challenges we went through it all. We can't. And what happens is that we, because we can't see like God can see, we actually design, we actually design a, a box of our own design to put our God into. We, we, we design what God should do, when He should do it and how He should do it. And it's our God design box. And here we are, we, we're doing things like A, B, C should equal this result. God, you didn't come through. What's the matter with you? You don't care. Do you remember that saying, I think I'll go and eat some worms? Christians are really full of faith and hope when things are going well. But the plan of a believer is that we've also got faith and hope when things aren't going well. And we don't understand what's going on. And sometimes I see believers go, oh, they just get so, you don't care, God, where are you? Man, I just think I'm gonna go and eat some worms. Uh, My nephew, Adam, when he was growing up, we were living in Colorado, was doing zoology at school and they were talking about earthworms and how they're a food source. And um, he come home that afternoon, he was about 11, I guess, with a huge, big, fat earthworm. And he was telling us that it's a food source. You can actually eat them. They're not harmful to you and everything. And I looked at him and said, really? And I knew one of Adam's favourite things is money. So I said, really, Adam? You can eat that worm and you'll be fine. It's good for you. He said, yeah, sure. I said, I'll tell you what. I'll give you $20 if you eat that worm. You've got to chew it up and swallow it and it's worth $20 to you. Are you happy to do that? He looked at me and went, and his mother and his auntie, my wife Leah, screaming at him, don't do it, don't do it, don't don't you dare do that, which actually helped my cause. (laughs) So he picked up that big worm, dropped it into his mouth, started chewing it. There was a little sliver and dirt down coming out of the side of his mouth as he ate that big fat juicy worm and swallowed it down. And his mother and Lee were on the ground crying and screaming. He's going to die. I can't believe it. Uh, I mean, it was fun to watch Adam eat the worm. But what happened to the mother and Lee was worth, this is the best $20 I've ever spent. And God lets us down. Oh, He doesn't care where is God. Look, I wanna tell you, it's not God's fault. We designed a special box and put Him in it. So we determined the what, the when, the where and the how, and it wasn't God who designed that at all. And eventually, down the track, after a while, we stand and realise and we are glad that His ways are not our ways. Even though at the time it didn't seem to make sense, it didn't seem to go the right way, it didn't happen in the time you wanted, it down the track, it was this sense of, you know what, I'm glad His ways are higher than my ways. This is where Romans 8.28 comes into uh, effect. And it says this, and we know that all things, everybody say all things. We know that not some things, not the good things, all things work together for good to those who love God and to those who are called according to His purpose. So not some things, not the good things, but all things work together for good to those who love God and are called according to His purpose. It comes into play and even when we don't understand how it's looking and how it's going at the moment, we understand that His ways are higher than our ways. And I am so glad His ways are higher than our ways. I'm so glad His thoughts are not my thoughts. I'm so glad His power is not my power. I am glad He is the God of the universe. Man, we look at appearances of people. The first thing to make an impression or something is how we dress. The whole world is built around first impressions and people on Instagram and TikTok and the way they look. And so we make decisions on how they are, or who they are, but the way they look. Man's ways is the outer appearance. God's ways, not the outer appearance. God's way, He looks at the heart of a human being. He doesn't look at the outside. He looks at your journey, your story, 
your background, where you've come from, who you are, your possibility. It's so different to the way that man looks at things. Man, man hoards because we are, we are built around survival, making sure we've got enough for our lot and that's all. But God's way is not about survival, it's about generosity. His ways are higher than our ways because in generosity, not only do you win, but somebody else wins as well. God gives, everybody wins. Man, we view life through good and bad and right and wrong, you know? The whole point of be good so Santa comes. You better be good so Santa will come this Christmas. We view life through, like, you're right, you're wrong. Or you're good and you're bad. That's man's way. God doesn't view life through right or wrong or good or bad. He views it through life and death. And so it's not about good or bad or right or wrong. What God calls sin and immorality is a part of that whole sin package there, whatever level you look at it on. He's not, he's not saying that's bad. He's saying that goes towards death. He looks through life. Everything He calls sin is not to say don't. It's that if you don't, you're going to go the wrong direction. Yeah, wow. Everything God speaks to is, He's not a cosmic wet blanket trying to put out everybody's fun. He's saying, understand that my ways are higher than your ways. And I view through, man, you go that way, that's going to be death. Sin causes death, death in your relationships, death in your self-worth, wow. death into your future, death into the things that are around our lives. He says, come and take life. God's ways are not right or wrong. And neither we, should, we should never look at life through right or wrong. Don't look at people out there and say they're wrong or they're bad. No, always view it from God's angle. Yeah, so Sin provides death, God provides life. Yes. His ways are different. They're higher than our ways. Man says, I will believe when I see. God says, believe and you will see. Man thinks that he has the answers of wisdom and strength. Man thinks he's got his own ability to bring good to the earth. You know, it's been a, a long time since Adam decided to follow, unfollow God on Instagram. It was a long time ago he walked out of the garden and I'm looking thousands of years, right? Thousands of years. And I've, I've historically looked back at all the seasons throughout history. And I want to tell you, the only time there has been a glimpse of decent civilization in thousands of years is when people decided to build their life on the Word of God. Yeah. Yeah. Thousands of years. I mean, thousands of years. You can take it all the way back. There's been people killing each other, wars everywhere, people that, that, that use other people for their own good, right through. The only time where there's been a glimpse of civilization is when people decided to not follow their own ways, but follow God's ways. Man thinks he has all the answers. But God says, I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. That's the pathway that he's called us to. We try to fix our problems from the outside, try and deal with this here and this and this there. And God's way is not about dealing with that, it's about dealing with this. Because yeah. when you fix this, then these things start to get better out here. He deals with the heart. There will be no peace on planet Earth until there is peace in the human heart. And the only way to get peace in the human heart is not from politics, science, education or technology, it's from Jesus Christ. He is the author of peace. You can't get peace any other way. You can't, it doesn't come from any other source and there'll be no peace on the earth until there's peace in the heart. I, I find it fascinating as I watch TV and the, the days we live in where there's wars around the world and you've got these anti-war demonstrators, the peace demonstrations. And what are they doing? They're burning their friends' cars. They're looting their neighbours' shops. They're beating up strangers on the street because we want peace. You don't ever get peace from violence. You only get peace from peace. And the only peace that comes is from Jesus Christ. It's crazy to think you're out there demonstrating for peace, burning and looting and killing people and beating them up. It's like, it's like watching a bad Netflix movie in your own house and slashing the lounge. I mean, that's how crazy it is. I'm, I'm going to burn my neighbour's house because I want peace somewhere out in the world. It's just wild and weird. Wild and weird. 
God's ways are so different to our ways. And this brings me to the whole Jesus story. (laughs) God looks at our mess and He doesn't wipe His hands of creation. He He devolves a plan to save mankind. And God's plan for salvation of you and I and the people of the earth is that it starts with a baby being born in a stable in a Middle Eastern country to an unmarried virgin. The world's a mess. God's got a plan. What's your plan, God? Don't worry, I've got it covered, guys. I'm gonna have an unmarried virgin give birth to a little baby in a stable in the Middle East. Yeah, good plan. I'm not sure that that's the script Hollywood would have chosen for saving the planet. I'm not sure they would have gone that way thinking that that was a great plan. As a matter of fact, this is one of my favourite cartoon photographs about saving the world. You know, there's the Hollywood script, but there's the real script. Jesus came and He did save the world from their own sins, their own mess, their own destruction. He's given us a way forward. Man's way, Jesus wouldn't have been born in a stable. He would have been born in a mansion. He would have had a famous last name. He would have been a celebrity, an influencer, a superstar, an Arnie Schwarzwagen type person. He would have, that would have been a famous thing about it. That's how the, the superstars are in, in the movies and that. But God's way wasn't about being born in a palace. It was about somebody being born in a stable. Yeah, right. Man's way would be, he'd be the next king that would rule over us and save the world. But God's way was, he didn't come to, ser- to, be, to, to be served. He came to serve others. It's all so different, our ways and God's ways. Not to dominate, but to set free Jesus had incredible gifts of healings and miracles. Man's way, they would have started a business empire off it, sold it over the internet, had all sorts of incredible things going on. But God's way was He would freely give to all that called upon His name. So different between how we think and the ways of God. 1 Corinthians 1 verse 18 through 25. The message of the cross is foolish to those who are headed for destruction. But we who are being saved know it it is the very power of God. And as the Scripture says, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, discard the intelligence of the intelligent. So where does this leave the philosophers, the scholars, the TikTokers, the world's brilliant debaters? God has made the wisdom of the world look foolish. Since God in His wisdom saw to it that the world would never know Him through human wisdom, He has used our foolish preaching to save those who believe. It is foolish to the Jews who ask for signs from heaven. It's foolish to the Greeks who seek human wisdom. So when we preach Christ crucified, the Jews are offended and the Gentiles say it's nonsense. But to all those who call by God to salvation, both Jews and Gentiles, Christ is the power of God, the wisdom of God, this foolish plan. God is wiser than the wisest of human plans. God's weakness is stronger than the greatest of human strength. God is not confounded by our own thoughts of wisdom. We have not done well for 7,000 years and I see no signs of it getting better in the future. It doesn't matter how smart we get with technology, how educated we get, and there's nothing wrong with any, well, it could be something wrong with some of those things. But anyway, the point being is that there's no answer for the future because we're just repeating the past. If we learn anything about the past is that we don't learn from the past. And it's Jesus it becomes our only hope. He says, the wisdom of man is crazy, they, but they think what we preach is foolishness. So let's go on with Jesus. He grows up. He's arrested and thrown into jail. You know why he was arrested? Because he went around healing the sick, feeding the poor, setting the captives free. People were so offended by him doing good, they threw him in jail. Now he's in jail. The Romans rule over the Middle East at this time. 
And every year they, they do a pardoning thing. They, they get a couple of prisoners up on a platform and to be nice to the Jewish people, they let the Jews choose who they would like to be set free this particular year. And this particular year, we have Jesus up here, the, the, uh, the, the one that heals the sick, the one that feeds the poor, the one that sets the captives free, uh, brings hope to those that are in despair. And then we have Barabbas over here, who's a murderer, an insurrector, a one that doesn't care about anybody else but himself. He's that one on this side of the platform. And he says, to the Roman leader says to the people, the, who do you want? Who do you want free? And they cried out, crucify Jesus, crucify Jesus, set free Barabbas, set free Barabbas. And I, I look at that and I thought, how stupid can people be? But well, let's bring it up to our day. Wow. Let's bring it up to humankind right now. Wow. We look at a, at, a, at a church or a Christian organisation that, that do good, that, that make hospitals and, and home care and look after the old people and rescue people out of trafficking and, and feed the poor around the world. Go to all where there's a mess or disaster. It's the church, the Christians doing good and they're, they're there and here we are. And on the other side, we have this woke human philosophy. It's about doing it yourself, doing it yourself, being who you are. Don't care about anybody, just do what you want. Wow. And the world stands there and says, crucify Jesus. You get rid of the ones who do good. Kill the ones who, who are saving the world with their, their heart and their money and their time and their prayers. Open, free this person. Free this spirit upon our world. Let us just do what we want. Nothing's changed in thousands of years. Crucify Him. Crucify Him. Man's way. Free Barabbas. Kill Jesus. God's way. You don't have to kill him. He'll give his life freely. You don't have to, you don't have to worry about killing him. He's going to die for you. And even you ones who cried out, crucify him. He's still going to die for you. He's still going to die for you. His death didn't bring death. It released life to all those who accept his truth. It didn't bring the revenge of the gods. Now out of his death came life abundant, life eternal. Salvation for all that called upon His Name. Man lays their dead Saviour in a tomb, but God raises Him from the dead. He was never going to stay in that ground. And nothing upsets a graveyard more than a good resurrection. And nothing wrecked the spirit world of darkness more than Jesus rising from the dead. To man, death is an end, but to God, death is just the beginning of a new season. He sees the highway, the big way, way beyond how we can see. Jesus is about all of us, everybody. He's about life coming out of death and pain, about new beginnings, about second chances, about a future, a hope, eternal salvation. We need to let God be God in our lives. Don't box Him in, let God be God. Don't put restrictions around Him like you think He should act. He's got it under control. He's got it under control. All things work for good to those who love God and are called according to His purposes. I'm going to read Proverbs chapter 3, verse 1 through 10. And I wish I hadn't put so many verses that I've got to read. But it's important. It's almost like a, um, not a cheat sheet, but a little breakdown or pull together of the most vital things for you and I to let God be God in our lives. So let's read it anyway. My son, do not forget my law, but let your heart keep my commandments. For length of days and long life and peace will they add to you. Let not mercy, truth and truth forsake you. Bind them around your neck. Write them on the tablet of your heart. And so find favour with high esteem in the sight of God and man. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge Him and He shall direct your paths. Do not be wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and depart from evil. It will be health to your flesh and strength to your bones. Honour the Lord with your possessions and with the first fruits of all your increase. So your barns will be filled with plenty and your vats will overflow with new wine. We need to let God out of our nicely manufactured box. He's too big to fit in your box. The Israelites back in the day, 
carried around God in an Ark of the Covenant, a small box. But as they realised He's too big to fit in a box man designed. But they didn't see it clearly yet. So they built a giant temple thinking, this is big enough for the God of the universe. But for a very short time, He lived there. But then we know that as Jesus died on that cross, the temple curtain was split from top to bottom. And again, God says, I'm too big to live in a man-made box. Do you know the only thing big enough to hold the presence of God is the heart and soul of a human being that God designed and God created. It's the only thing big enough in the universe to hold the presence of God. And He said, that's where I want to live in the heart of my people. Know His Word, Proverbs. Do what He says. Write His truth on your heart. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Don't lean on your own understanding. Acknowledge Him, worship Him, honour Him. He will direct your paths. Don't be wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord. Be in awe of Him. Honour the Lord with your possessions and the first fruits of your increase. I want to tell you today, His ways are not our ways. His ways are higher than our ways, better than our ways, stronger than our ways. They're greater, they're deeper. Let God, let this God be God in your life. Psalm 100 verse 3. Know that the Lord, He is God. It is He who has made us, not we ourselves. We are His people, the sheep of His pasture. We did not make ourselves, God made us. So He knows what's best for us. At the end of the day, I want to tell you, at the end of the day, every person that has been born or will be born will believe on something or will believe somebody. They will trust in something or they will trust in somebody. We can't help it. We've got to believe something. And the Bible is very clear. Believe upon your Lord, the God Almighty. He's the one that created the heavens and the earth. We did not make ourselves, but He made us. That's not our reason, our understanding. Now let's let's go to God's wisdom, God's power, God's life. 12 years ago, I was diagnosed with throat cancer and then... When I was getting treatment for that, they diagnosed me with lung cancer. And with throat cancer, I was feeling pretty good about, you know, it's all gonna be okay. Then when they said there's lung cancer, it became a real calamity in my mind and my heart about what's gonna happen now. And, and what happened was when they diagnosed me with throat cancer, uh, they said, we can't treat your lung uh, for at least six months until you get better with from your throat. And the treatment we give your throat will have nothing to do about helping your lung. And I said, so what's the outcome here? And they said, we're just hoping that in six months it hasn't spread through the rest of your body or it hasn't grown too big that we can't operate it in your lung. And in that season of time, I had to come to grips with my future. And my prayer became this, God, in life and in death, You are my breath. In life and in death, You are my breath. All things work together for good to those who love God and are called according to His purposes. Your ways, are tr- I'm not trusting my understanding, I'm trusting your ways. That was my prayer right through. So six months later, I finally go in for an x-ray on my lung and I'm thinking, man, I hope it's big enough, not big enough that, that it can operate or it hasn't spread through my body. And, and they pulled me in, they sat me down, they got these bewildered looks on their face and they said, what? and I'm going, what, what, what is it? And they said, the tumour's gone. It's disappeared. You've been healed, somehow healed. I know this. My life, my future, my eternity is in His hands. And at the end, my best future, in the end, my best future will become will come by letting God be God in my life. Would you close your eyes and bow your heads for a second? Lord, I thank You right now. God, I pray that Your Spirit would delve deep into the human heart right now, that we start to unravel the box that we've put You into, our design. And we're gonna make a decision to let God be God in our lives. In Jesus' Name.
Amen. Amen.